Good morning, everyone. Good morning.
morning, good morning, good morning. Welcome to Tiger Covenant Church. I'm Pastor David Greenidge. We're here to praise God. If you all agree online, welcome. Say amen. And give the Lord a hand clap. Amen. We have a guest speaker this morning, Pastor and Reverend David Stockamp. He's our missionary to Congo. And we're so glad he and Celia are here. Give them a hand clap. Amen. Well, we are here to worship God. We're here to praise God. We're here to see the power of God work in our hearts and also to work online for those of you that are watching online, live with Facebook, and watch it later on. Be blessed. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can lift up a song of praise. We thank you for Adrian and the worship team and all that are here. We ask, God, that your Holy Spirit would just descend on us and the power of your love would be supreme. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus, Lord. you in this place, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
Jesus, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, just fill this place this morning, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you're here, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you are just leading this service, God, Lord, today, God, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Do you guys know the song, Heavenly Father? Heavenly Father, I appreciate you. Heavenly Father,
and adore you Lord can you just lift up your hands to him right now and just focus your eyes on him because he is worthy of our praise hallelujah hallelujah we worship you Lord hallelujah oh we give you glory and honor Lord hallelujah in this place today Lord we worship you. Thank you, Lord. We glorify you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We appreciate you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 You know what people are going through right now. You know the people that have raised their hands, what they need of you. And I ask God, you would grant them the desires of their hearts. 
you'd bring healing, that you'd bring strength, that you'd bring deliverance, that you'd make a way out of no way, that you do the impossible. We thank you that you're the God of the impossible. With God, all things are possible. So we ask for your divine intervention in our midst, that you'd bring healing to our body, that you'd strengthen us. We ask that you'd strengthen your servant as he gets ready to present and to give your word today. Reverend Stockamp, that you'd bless him. Bless his wife, Celia. We just thank you for Adrian and for the wonderful worship that she's led us in this morning and the rest of the worship team. We ask God now that you would enrich us, that you would draw us closer to the throne, that you would save us. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we all said, amen. We're going to dismiss our children for Children's Church. You can go now. Give them a hand clap and say go. Amen for the kids. It is my distinct honor to present to you our speaker of the morning. We won't uh, delay it any longer. He is a good friend of mine of many years. He served in our denomination as a missions facilitator. And more recently, he's been missionary to the country of Congo. He comes with the power of the Holy Spirit. He has a video that he's going to uh, present to us at this time. And then after the video, he'll come and take the microphone and bless us with a word of encouragement, a word from the scriptures. Give Pastor David and Reverend David Stockham a hand clap. And then we'll watch the video. I want to thank you for your continuing partnership with me as we journey together in making a difference here in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Thank you and God bless. Good morning, church. I'm grateful to be here. My wife, Celia, and I are so grateful that uh, we could be with you this morning. And it is like a homecoming, home cooking, worship, and we were ushered into the presence of God. And um, I'm, it is a joy that I have my brother Dale and his wife Gail, our sister-in-law, with us today. And um, it is uh, a real blessing to be back with, with everyone. 
many faces remembered, new faces to have uh, an opportunity to have new friendships. Um, if one of the fellows could lower that table down here to this level where I am, I'd appreciate it. Um, I would be remiss if we did not take an opportunity to also give a shout out to Trish Greenidge, the first lady of our congregation. We miss you, Trish. We thank God for you. Thank you for your faithfulness and your advocacy before the throne. All right. So that being said, you know, coming back home brings all kinds of memories. And um, one memory that did fail me is I took one wrong turn to get to church. So I'm not exactly a homing pigeon. Uh, got some props here that we'll use for the, the message today. On behalf of the Evangelical Covenant Church and the Congo Covenant Church, we want to say thank you. Merci Mingi, as they say in Lingala. Thank you very much for your faithfulness and uh, the support that you have given me to be a blessing to other people. This is the first time we've been back post-COVID. We were allowed an opportunity to uh, stream uh, a message in from my, my home in Georgia uh, a couple of years ago, but to be here in person, oh, what a blessing. Um, this is a special occasion for us. Uh, Celia doesn't like the, the terminology I've used, so we're gonna try to change that. I, I'd referred to this uh, week and a half as the farewell tour. Uh, we have an opportunity to visit six congregations in the next eight days to thank them for their faithfulness as retirement, not resignation, Dave. Uh, a retirement looms in the horizon at the end of this year. And God has some wonderful things in store for us. Uh, and although I will not be as a full-time covenant missionary anymore at that time, the volunteer part of me is going to remain. I'm gonna help with editing and uh, grant writing and also counsel and cheerleading for our Congo covenant church leaders. So that part will not go away. But God is adding on other things, opportunities for uh, helping to reduce recidivism in uh, the, the state of Georgia, second highest incarceration rate in the nation, and also possibly chairing a, another mission organization as a, as a board, also on voluntary uh, basis. Celia is also one to not let uh, dust settle on her. She's actively involved with uh, Wednesday nights and teen teaching with uh, a, a couple of other people. They're taking on the fours and fives. And she says, I cannot do this in the flesh. And she's right. She had 12 kids the other night, very active. I don't know what it is. It runs in the pastor line of family. Those seems to be, you know, the grandchildren of the, 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 the pastor of the church that we're attending. It seemed to be uh, the most energetic. Let's just say that. Um, but we're of the philosophy that as long as God gives you health, as long as you're still moving, move it. <laughs> move it for him. So, and I seriously want to thank you for your partnership uh, for these past several years. Truly, I come back here and my heart is flooded with memories. It's... Uh, a joy to, to see the faithfulness of this congregation as you continue to grow and be a light in this area in the Pacific Northwest. As the environment gets darker and darker, the light is needing to be shown all the more, and you're doing it. Praise God that you had 14 fellows show up for uh, the, the, the Bible study and 19 ladies. So <laughs> shout out to the ladies. Oh, and, and the new carpet's a nice touch, too. Okay. <laughs> so I want to thank you for your faithfulness and, and, and partnership. We know that uh, over the years, I've taken some hits health-wise, and you have been here to help pick up the pieces along with my family and dust me off and remind me of the grace of God and who we are in Christ and what can still be done in faith and it's been a beautiful journey. So photo number one, we got Chris there. Um, 
So for those who may need a refresher, I have spent a lot of time in the Democratic Republic of Congo and for 44 years I've been involved in some level of cross-cultural ministry. And that is a testimony of God's faithfulness and grace because it can only be done in his power. My primary emphasis has been on pastoral formation in the country of Congo. And while I've been a non-resident missionary, Celia and I have partnered and covenanted together that those years apart, two and a half years apart, in, a, in not all in one lump, but over the space of time, we've agreed together that this is the sacrifice and the calling that God has given us to do. So ministry in the Democratic Republic Republic of Congo has afforded me an opportunity to learn a lot from my covenant brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's also giving me an opportunity to speak words of hope, of encouragement, and correction in love. And today I would like to intertwine some updates of the Democratic Republic of Congo along with some scripture that comes in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 to 15, which we'll read in a little bit. And it comes from the Apostle Peter. You remember Peter? Yeah, how about that guy? Um, let's see, let's look at his resume just a little bit. Tried to walk on water and got wet. Who of us have tried? He's the one that tried to discourage Jesus from going to the cross and got reproached, rebuked saying, get behind me, Satan. He's the one that slept when he was supposed to keep watch. He's the one that impulsively cut the ear off of the high priest's servant's ear. He was the one, when push came to shove, was saying, I don't know the guy, and was nowhere to be found except for the disciple John at the foot of the cross on that day. Not exactly a robust resume, right? It's full of epic fails. However, that's one thing I do like about the flaws and the scriptures being exposed. Who else would do that? We try to clean up our act and polish and uh, get things ready for public reading. And here is the unvarnished version of people. And I guess that's a little bit of the reason why I like that uh, series, The Chosen. You get to see this motley crew of would-be disciples in their raw form with their own issues. And that's how God takes us in life as well, with our own issues. And with the power of his Holy Spirit, he can do something. Now, to be fair to, to Peter, uh, let's also remember that he's the one that allowed Jesus to come into the boat. He's the one who cast his nets into the deep when it wasn't the time to throw nets in. He's the one that told Jesus that he was the one that had the words of eternal life and he wasn't leaving him. He's the one that also confessed that Jesus was the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said that the Holy Spirit had revealed that to him. He's also the one that when it came to the day of Pentecost, filled with the Holy Spirit, preached a powerful sermon guided by the Holy Spirit, 3,000 people repented and believed and came into the church. He's the one that also stood up with John to the Sanhedrin and said, we ought to obey God rather than man. He's the one that also saw that there was the gospel needing to be advanced even among non-Jews and witness to Cornelius was made available and the first Romans believed in, 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 in Jesus. He's the one that also testified in the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15 that no, we don't need these other customs to be tagged on and added to our simple faith in Christ as our Redeemer. Now he did have a little bit of backtracking that Apostle Paul had to correct him in Galatians chapter two, we see that. But on balance, what a tremendous contribution to the life of the church. And we get one more glimpse of him. If Paul, Peter the aged now, advanced in years with persecution on his doorstep, and he wants to desperately, despite his failures and weaknesses, do something for his audience 
that we find in First and Second Peter in the epistles. He wants them to lean into God's grace. Just as he has leaned into God's grace for forgiveness, he went on for that. He lived in the reality of forgiveness and grace and pushed forward in that knowledge. And this is what he had on his heart. Let's turn now to our gospel reading, or not our gospel reading, but our epistle reading in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 to 15. And I'm reading from uh, the English Standard Version. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it is right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will soon, will be soon, as our Lord Jesus made it clear to me. And I will make every effort so after my departure, you may be able to, at any time, recall these things. Okay. Here we have in Scripture Peter reminding the people of some certain virtues that are necessary. What's the backdrop of this story? Well, in 1 Peter... He wrote to an audience that was scattered in Northwest Asia Minor, which, was, which is modern-day Turkey, and reminded them that even though they are living in a toxic and impressive culture where they are relegated to the bottom rung, that they have a role to fulfill. They have Christian ethics to, to live out. They are to exude faith in difficult circumstances. And he carries on that theme in the second epistle to Peter where there is a doctrinal error that is going to be addressed. You see, people at that time, uh, while they believed, they also said, I'm not too sure about this second coming of Jesus. I think Peter might have something to say about that since he saw the transfiguration of the transformed Christ. He did. And he wants them to remember that as his end is approaching, that they remember. And it's the same thing for us. We have reminders in our own lives. We have birthdays and anniversaries. July 4th, 1776. December 7th, 1941. April 4th, 1968. And also 9-11. Many of us who were alive at that time can remember where we were. So I was talking with my brother Dale. He was in Washington, D.C. the day the the plane hit the Pentagon. You can't forget a sound like that. You can't forget uh, these these events that we we have that are an indelible mark in our lives. You'll even remember where you were, what you were thinking. In the same fashion... On a positive note, we have an opportunity for what Peter calls to remember, and he wants to remind them of who they are in Christ. And so if you look up in verses 5 through um, 8, you'll see that there are certain Christian virtues that Peter wants them to hold on to. They are theirs as a legacy given by Jesus Christ. So what are they to put on? They are to put on virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, and brotherly affection, and love. All of those qualities are theirs. And as Peter is getting near the end of his time, he wants them to remember and not forget. And in this letter is, is unique. Out of all the letters in the Bible... This one is what we would call a testimonial. It's like what Jacob did in Genesis chapter 48, where he summoned the 12 sons before his end, and he blessed them. A testimonial is you want to put things in order. You want people to remember after you are gone what the important things are as part of their future legacy. This is what Peter is doing for his audience there. And uh, he desperately wanted this for his readers, to remember the truth. Now, 
I have felt like Peter in these last stages of my career ministry in the Congo. While I have learned much and I am so grateful, it has stretched me as well. Western Christians want to count the cost. They want to calculate everything that it's going to be in place and then they'll move forward. I've learned from my Congolese brothers and sisters, no, it's an, part of an Abrahamic covenant. You go to a land that you don't know where you're going. You take the first step. You don't know where it's going to land, but you're asked to move. Somewhere in between, we have the whole gamut of God's will and blessing. So I've learned much from them, and I believe they've learned from me as well as planning. Um, it's been an opportunity for me to speak boldly into their lives of love. You can do this. Remember. And it's been iron sharpening iron. It's been a time for us together mutually to lean into God's grace. Now we have the second photo. Here we go. For over eight years, I've been given the privilege of working with five master Congolese trainers and they represent the point of the arrow. Pastor Vungbo, Abulu, Bula, Amwa, and Koto, we've been working together consistently and solidly for a number of years. And I can remember very early in 2014, here in this congregation, you, you learned that I had a heart attack while I was over in Congo. And we hadn't even started this program. How is this all going to happen? And it was a time to remember and remind each other that by God's grace, all things are possible. Each one of these books on practical theology has been produced by the team one year at a time, which serves as the next year's training materials for the pastors that they teach. And over a period of time, we have produced seven volumes on practical theology, each one representing a year. And they're working on their eighth one now. It's done in the Lingala language, and we have hundreds of participants each year. And as you saw in the film, over 5,000 pastors in aggregate have uh, participated in that program. It's an enduring, lasting legacy, not only for this generation of pastors, but for those who will come to remind them of who they are in the scriptures. And what's unique about this program is, is that it is indigenous. That means it's been from the bottom up. This isn't some type of Western curriculum that has been translated and say, here, now you adapt to that. It's always generated from somebody outside when you do that. This comes from the inside and from up within. On practical theology, we had uh, a a challenge before us that uh, it continues to go on to this very day. And when you've been together on these road trips, you form a bond. Common experiences become legend. They become something to laugh about and recall, oh, God was so good. One uh, place in particular, there was a village in Monveda that was waiting for us to come. We had uh, truck issues and we were late. And the food that had been prepared in the morning and now is ready to be served in the late afternoon without refrigeration, now it, it, it had been out there for a while. So I decided just to eat the rice. <laughs> okay. And that was a good decision. The next day, one by one, the pastor was saying, oh, last night was just so terrible. I just kept running back and forth to the bathroom. You know, and so I had some anti-diarrheal medication that I'd given. But one by one, they all came. And it became, the village was called Monveda. And any time after that, when there was some questionable food, they just said, Monveda. <laughs> and, and everyone knows, well, I'm going to pass that dish. Thank you very kindly, but we're going to go on to the next one. But that was an internal joke. It's, it's something you get over time. As you, as you pour out your sweat and your blood together, that is a gift from God, and it's, it's a memory. Photo number three. Um, time and again, we saw God's provision. When trucks would break down, God would send 20 mud angels to push us out 
of the, of the pits. And it's a, no AAA out there. It's not a cakewalk. It's a spiritual battle as Satan tries to distract, discourage, and derail uh, a time like that is to lean into God's grace. Next photo. It's rough getting started as a uh, team together. There was this power structure just because of the ed educational differential of, okay, how are we going to work with Dr. David? All right? So that was one of the first things that I had to do was lean into God's grace and expose my vulnerability, confess my mistakes over a long period of uh, time as serving as a missionary. You're going to make a lot of memorable ones, just like Peter's resume. Okay, I had mine, and it was time to be transparent and to lean on to the team, leaning by God's grace, that, you know what? This isn't going to work unless we all believe and lean into God's grace that we have something to offer one another, something to contribute to each other, and it's going to take all of us rowing on that canoe to get across to the other side. And over a period of time, that happened, and we are so grateful. By God's grace, uh, we, we saw that in the research that we were doing, we asked a lot of pastors, what are your biggest challenges that you are facing now as you are out of seminary, you're out of Bible school, you're in the village, what is different? What didn't you learn in your Bible Institute? What do you wish that you had learned? What did you forget and you want another second chance to go around? What are some gnawing issues that really bother your personal life? And based upon a survey that the, pa the pastoral team put together, they harvested a treasure trove of information of what the pulse was of the pastor in the village. And they, as they tallied all of that together, you, next picture, they, they categorized that into responses. Okay, well, this, this one has to deal with Bible knowledge. These issues have to deal with contemporary issues that are bothering our pastors. This is an area of ethics, of how we relate to one another. And as we separated all of those responses out from hundreds of pastors, it started to become clear different categories of how we could put training material into a book. And each of the pastors was assigned two articles which became chapters in a, in a book. I would help them with finding the research material. It might be a book that they would have or something that we could do with research one-on-one -on -one online together talking with them and they would um, begin to work on their chapters which would go into the book. Now, at first, getting out of the block, our team leaders were computer illiterate. That was really a challenge of trying to read Lingala manuscripts day, hours on end. My brain was fried. But as I inputted it, we had some printers, and we put it out on paper, and we'd give them back a draft of their article. And then we'd give it a copy to another of, 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 of the colleagues. Everybody was reading e each other's articles, and they were commenting on it. There were red marks that were, were put on and was finally given back to me and we do another revision and another revision, three or four revisions. And by that time, then we'd hand it over to them and say, here's your baby. And everybody was happy that their, their article was finished so they wouldn't have to sweat that anymore. And at the end of that first year, Reverend Bungbo said, David, we're no longer going to call you doctor. We're going to call you the accoucheur. You're the midwife. And, keep <laughs> and I love that title because it was uh, God, God sent to help bring birth to a vision, a view that uh, people had just to get that into reality. Next picture. The next year, the team switched over to computers. Yes! <laughs> However, that's fraught with problems too. How do you charge it? What do you do when you get an error message on a screen and you have to translate it from French into Lingala and you're doing that on the telephone? <laughs> um, that, that every, every step in advance poses different uh, issues. But 
Reverend Ambonau is our primary editor, and he's doing a great job. In fact, it's humbling for me when I think I've got an article and it's nicely done and I've, I've, I've read it two or three times. This is the one area I can't ask Celia to help me. She, she does all of my English stuff and proofreads it. It doesn't go out the door unless she signs off on it, okay? Um, but it's a humbling experience when I'm done and I give that article to Reverend Ambwa and it comes back dripping with red ink <laughs> and learning new words that I didn't know about before. It's an iron sharpening, iron process. And that is the gift of when we lean into each other, that song, Lean On Me, leaning into each other, but also into God's grace that this will happen. Next photo. And so over the years, I stayed in the background and the team gelled together that they were doing all the planning. There were six areas in this uh, church field that covers the size of the state of Ohio of how they would decentralize this educational training by six four-day seminars. Where are they gonna go first? Who's going to do the first message? You sped that out and it was wonderful to see the communication that took place. They are leaning into God's grace, and it was a period of time for me to realize what John had said, he must increase, they must increase, and I must decrease. And it was good to see that transformation take place. So when people ask me, well, you're not going back to Congo anymore? Well, yeah, that's right, because God's work is alive and well and thriving, and they're they're, they're leaning into God's grace, and I need to lean on that grace, too. Next photo. So with, with that, my role became more of a facilitator, a cheerleader, and the objectives uh, have, have changed. And I need to learn to speak my piece when it's time when I'm asked. And that's a great thing to, to watch. So currently, the team is on their eighth volume on practical theology. They've traveled thousands of miles that we would see roads as impassable by our standards. They've experienced breakdowns, delays, hunger, stress, and they've remained faithful. Next photo, even in the midst of opposition. I wish I had time to unpack this story, but let's just say that earlier this year, in February, while uh, going to one of the remote areas the team was attacked by some malcontents. And it really shook things up. And it was time to regroup, just like what Peter did, to remind his audience that they remember God's faithfulness over all the years, that this is one time where they had a, a setback, but it's not going to throw things off of mission. So they're already talking about what they're doing the next time they go through this, this area. And that's a prayer request that I have for us, that we remember them. Uh, next photo, Reverend Koto Kambu, one of the team members, has another issue. And that is that you think racism is alive and well here in the United States and in, in, in pockets? Well, tribalism is just one person trying to control another that's the age-old problem of our fallen nature is to dominate one another. Uh, he has been living in a very stressful situation uh, where tribes have not been getting along with each other and personal attacks have come back to him twice within the last year. Somebody has approached his house under cover of dark and tried to set his grass roof on fire. And the last time the neighbors who were very loyal to Pastor Koto said, we know who's behind this, let's go burn their houses. And no, here he is trying to keep both parties at bay so that the gospel can continue to go forward. And that takes a time to lean into God's grace fully. The next photo, as I shared over the years, we've had a number of pastors participate. And that's great. How big of a desire do these pastors have for these seminaries? 
of those surveyed want to come back for next year's. Next photo. But sometimes bridges are out. Sometimes pastors on their way are accosted by government authorities and trying to get the shakedown to, to pay a little bribe to get past a checkpoint. Sometimes their bicycle or motorcycle breaks down. 60% of all the participants report some difficulty in getting to the seminar and back. Can you imagine if we were to send that out with some of the publicity for a midwinter conference or gather or some denominational gathering? Well, please come, but 60% of you are going to have a hassle. I think attendance might go down a little bit. But here they want to do it, and that is their sweat equity. So I am so grateful for their dedication. It's my privilege now, as they continue to do the work on their own, to phone in a prayer, to greet the, the seminars. They'll, they'll hold the microphone and the phone together, and, they'll, and uh, that's the way I can communicate. But as long as I'm able, I'm going to help uh, them. Uh, remember. Thank you, Tiger Covenant Church, for your partnership in this ministry journey. Getting back to Peter now. Knowing that his time was near, he had a constant barrage of exhortations and encouragements and reminders to give to the readers. His major emphasis was on memory, and that is our emphasis for today as well. It's about what Christ has done in our lives and what he is doing. So if you knew your time was short or had a limited opportunity to remind others of how good God is, how would you use that limited time? What would you say? In God's economy, each one of us has been given a unique set of relationships and circumstances and opportunities to remind others of how good God is. It's not to be kept by ourselves. Um, empowered by the Holy Spirit, Peter was able to rise above his failings and fully lean into God's grace and to go full throttle for the Lord. He was no longer paralyzed by guilt or shame, and neither do we have to be in that state anymore. Christ died so that we could be unshackled and free. Peter writes, each one of us uh, should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. So no matter what our lot, no matter what our station in life, Peter encourages us to lean into the same grace that he found. Despite his failings and misgivings, God's Spirit moved mightily through him, and that same Spirit moves mightily through us today. And for that to become full throttle, we need a cleansing we need a refreshing that comes from the form of worship. We need to lean into God's unshackling grace. He makes all things new. And then we need to seek God's guidance, his spirit's guidance on our unique set of relationships and circumstances. When delays happen, they can become opportunities. When your seat assignment changes, it might be a divine appointment just waiting. So you had one on the way out here with Teresa. Normally we like to sit together, but this time we sat aisles across and so you had a wonderful opportunity to share God's love with Teresa. And it was a woman at the well moment. It was also a reminder, come home. That's what God is asking each one of us to do, members of Tiger Covenant Church, friends of Tiger Covenant Church. It's to have the patience and the ability to see beyond our present circumstances that maybe God is rearranging our lives, our schedule today, to let go so that he can do something amazing. Immediately following uh, our text, 
Peter prepares the readers for the coming of the Lord. How many of us woke up this morning with the return of Jesus in mind? It's coming. It's true. It will be realized. So let's get ready for it. Peter knows that the glory is coming because he tasted it by watching his master transform. He saw that borne out in the, in the prophecies of the scriptures as he poured over that. Remember, Jesus opened the minds of the disciples to understand that same spirit is for us today. He's just waiting for us to lean into it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your redemptive grace in the life of the Apostle Peter. Thank you that in your economy, in his life and in ours, nothing is ever lost, nothing is ever wasted. It all can be used for your good. There's not a scrap left on the cutting floor because you weave it and you fashion it into a beautiful tapestry of our lives. So we thank you, God. Thank you for your faithfulness in our lives. Help us to lean more fully on you and one another so that we can lean into your promises and nudge this world. In Jesus' name, amen. As Pastor David was speaking, my heart was stirred. He said something that was very interesting. And thank you, Pastor David. Thank you, Celia, for being here. What he said was that the Congolese pastors operated by faith. David, from his perspective, was a planner. And they both leaned into each other. That really spoke to me. And then he uh, wonderfully um, spoke about the scripture in, in uh, 2 Peter. And as we look at that scripture, I think God is telling us as a church to lean into his grace, that Peter was facing, P Peter was facing tribulation, Peter was facing difficult times. And you see how David over the years has ministered to a people who have faced difficulty and the grace of God showed up. All of us here can take something out of the sermon. I personally took something out of it. I wrote notes about it, that all of us here and I like what you said, David, when you said we are unique in our relationships that we have with people. And so all of us here, just over the last week, have faced some unique things that only we here this morning have faced. Those of you that are watching online, the same thing. And so as we get ready to pray and before we close our service, I'd like you to ponder with me a few things. Ponder the fact that God loves you, that he has a plan for your life, even though you and I have both gone through some difficult times. That he wants to bless you. That he wants you to be a blessing to other people, to love other people. And that in the middle of your difficult situation, that as you have faith to turn it over to him, you can see victory in your life. So let's bow your heads in prayer. The elders are looking with me this morning. And so firstly, I want to ask, is there somebody that, as you heard the gospel message this morning, that Christ died on the cross for your sins? That's the gospel message. That's what grace is, that Christ died for your sins, that you could have eternal life, that you could have a new life. And if you're here this morning or if you're watching online, chat me up. Just say, Pastor David, I need Jesus. If you're here, raise your hand, and I want to pray for you. I need the Lord Jesus Christ in my heart. I want salvation. Just raise your hand. Don't be afraid. This is your moment to receive Christ. And if you would agree with that, then say with me, Lord Jesus. Just whisper this prayer to God. Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I acknowledge you as Lord and Savior over my life. I believe that you died for me. I believe that you rose for me. Now fill me. Say it. Fill me with your precious Holy Spirit. Come into my heart. At the church today, if Pastor uh, myself or Alvin or Chuck will be in the back. Come see me. 
we want to make sure you get a Bible. You can walk in your salvation. And those of you that are believers in Jesus, you're saints and God is speaking to you also. And I want to lead you in a prayer. So if you're at a place this morning where you're saying, Pastor David and Reverend David, I want God to move in my heart in the middle of my difficult situation. Would you raise your hand? We want to pray for you. All of us are going through stuff. My hand is up with you. Father God, I ask that you touch your people online and people here in person that have raised their hands, that acknowledge in their need of your grace. We ask, oh God, that you would move mightily, that you would heal our hearts, heal our minds, help us to work through the difficult places in our heart and in our minds that as we surrender to you, we say yes to you, we surrender. Now, Lord, would you just move in our hearts, move in our lives, give us a good day. Give us victory. Help us to continue to pursue you, continue to read our word, to continue to come to church. And as we pursue you, we ask that you'd heal our minds, heal our hearts, heal relationships. So we, by faith, say yes to you and yes to your grace. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you feel like God touched your heart this morning, say amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. He's good. Thank you, David. Thank you for what you did. We're going to ask Latasha to come forward. She's going to lead us in announcements, and then uh, Brother Chuck is going to send the benediction. Pastor David and I will be in the back. We want to shake your hands, and we want to love on you. Pastor David is our minister, uh, our minister to Congo, and he's indicated that he is retiring, and this church has supported his ministry for many years. A portion of everything that you give goes to fund missions for Pastor David and other mission uh, works that we're supporting. So we thank you for your support of Pastor David. Not Latasha. <laughs> this is Alvin. <laughs> Good morning, church. Uh, we want to welcome our visitors. If you visit us for the first time, we say thank you for coming to fellowship with us. Uh, I just want to personally thank David and Celia. I love you guys so much. Thank you for your prayers for me. Uh, we pray for you guys a lot. So we love you. Glad you're home. So. Let's give them another round of applause. We, we missed you guys, so keep up the good work. Very encouraged to know that the Congolese is in good hands. Amen. All right. Uh, also, we have our Christmas choir starting in October, October the 6th at 7 p.m. So if you're interested, please see Deborah. She's out for the next couple of weeks. So uh, see Pastor or myself, and we would love to pass that information on to Deborah. We're still looking for cooks and servers for Tuesday nights. We are pretty staffed right now, but we'd like to keep that pipeline full so if you want to serve or if you're looking to serve and use your gift come and see us we want to give you an opportunity to use the gift that God has given you to serve the body of Christ so we're in service of the king so please come and see us we want to give you an opportunity to serve here and then thank you for giving online like pastor said as you can see with uh, Reverend Stockham some of the work they do some of the where the money goes to support people in the other countries, so please keep giving, amen? Well, let's stand as Chuck come to give the benediction. Thank you, Latasha. <laughs> I couldn't pass that one up. Just couldn't do it. Oh. David, it's amazing how 44 years you served the people in the Congo. I'm sure they're going to miss you tremendously. Uh, enjoy your retirement, but we all know that one day you'll get to meet them again, and you'll be with them for eternity, and uh, maybe you'll introduce us to them. That would be fun. We'd love that. So remember today as you go out, hear these words from Jude. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with the great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. So as you go out today, remember what Pastor David always says. Grab your bait, go fishing, serve the Lord. And tell somebody about the love of Jesus. Thank you.